Well, let's go ahead and get started because we I know Elliot has a lot to share with you and we are so excited to be here this evening. I'm Julie Van Sickle. I'm the director of our HSU Natural History Museum. And we're excited to this be our very first evening lecture since the pandemic started. So some of you have attended in person our evening lectures. We missed those, but we're glad we're able to do this one tonight to connect. We've been doing lots of school visits and lots of working with our community youth, and we're excited to have um, a, a more varied and a more adult audience here this evening um, for this presentation of questions to ask dinosaurs. Um, and so it's presented by the museum, and we're pleased to have Elliot DeBille here tonight um, back to speak with us again. He's done talks for us before, and we just have so appreciated it. A couple of things, um, just as a reminder, to please keep your Mike's muted until we'll have some time at the end for Q&A, although if, we, if you do have questions, we encourage you to put those in the chat um, to any of us, although Elliot will be presenting, so if you put those in the chat to Melinda Bailey, our assistant manager, she'll be monitoring those, or to me, um, we'll be monitoring those and, and help manage those at the end for Elliot, we'll read them to him, so that would be terrific. Um, but as you think of them, go ahead and put them in there. Um, this session is being recorded, so if you have any questions about that, you're welcome to pop that in the chat to me if there's any questions or concerns. We had a couple of youngsters from the East Coast that really wanted to join us tonight, but it is very late on the East Coast, and so they asked if we could please record this session so that they would have a chance to view it as well. Um, so I wanted to let all of you know about a couple other upcoming events for our museum. While our doors are still physically closed, um, we are very busy behind the scenes and doing things online. Um, we're starting the process of updating some of our displays. Um, in fact, we had a couple new exhibits that were about to be installed right before the pandemic. And so we're looking forward to finally getting to install those as well as some additional ones we've been working on over this past um, time. We also have some online virtual experiences coming up that we encourage all of you to participate in, or if you um, know of others that might be interested, um, we'd like to invite you to join us on Saturday, November 6th from 10 to noon. This is the life and times of dinosaurs, fun for the whole family. We're going to have um, some history, some trivia, lots of fun games, and this is really meant for the whole family and people of all ages to join in. Um, on their own with their families, and um, but really for, for everyone, for our community. This would be like a discovery day is in person and really just open to the community and looking to learn together. The next one we have there from Asteroids to Ammonites, a journey through time. That one is an after school program. So that's eight to 12 year olds is our focus there. And that's going to be Monday, November 15th through 19th. That's a Monday through Friday. Um, and I'll be 4 to 5.15, so if any of you have kids in your lives, and one really fun thing about doing this online is sometimes we would get people from out of town that aren't local that can zoom in and join us, and they will get an activity of all sorts of material, or packet of all sorts of activities and materials ahead of time, so advanced registration is really important because we send them some solar beaters and solar beads and rocks and Fossils, we have a whole collection of things that um, all of the registrants from that program are going to get as part of it. And that's um, $20 for members and $25 for non-members for the whole week of fun and the packet full of goodies. And we will also be starting our fall harvest bingo soon. That will be up on our website um, in the next week or so. So we'll be playing bingo with the community. We have a bingo board for you and some fun prizes you can win. And that also is for people of all ages. Last year we had um, quite a variety of people um, play, so that was really fun. Um, for all information about any of our programs, if you go to our website under news and announcements, you can find out more and I'll pop that into chat here in just a moment so you can follow that link and you can sign up and find out all the details there. All right, so what I'd like to do now um, is I have a couple other folks from the museum here with me. I have our assistant manager, Melinda Bailey, who's going to announce our guest speaker here in a moment. And I also have one of our HSU student interns, Amelia Shaw, joining us here this evening. Um, so I just wanted to introduce both of them and welcome all of you um, here this evening. All right, Melinda, I'll turn it over to you. All right, I am going to introduce Elliot. Again, as Julie said, um, 
We've had Elliot uh, talk about dinosaurs a couple of years ago. Um, he's got a full collection of replicas. It's a little difficult on the Zoom um, <laughs> than you to do that, but uh, we know that he's a dinosaur aficionado. He's a retired high school teacher. He's taught at uh, McKinleyville High School for 15 years. He's currently the president of Friends of the Arcata Marsh. He's very active in our community um, with it just educational outreach, helping at the marsh, doing whatever needs to be done there, um, whether they need to lead natural history tours or train other people. Um, he's got an education at a, a bachelor's in biology, a master's in education. He's um, a certified nurse and a registered nurse, I should say. Um, and he's here tonight because he loves dinosaurs and he jumped in a car after retiring and visited um, as many dinosaur museums in the West as he could. And that he um, is very knowledgeable and is here to share some of his knowledge with us tonight. So we're really excited. Thank you, Elliot. All righty. Thank you, Melinda. And welcome to all of you. What a treat to be here with a group of people that want to talk about dinosaurs. I have a series of slides to put up, but just to make sure we're in the right mood, I just pulled out one fossil model here. And if you know sauropods, this is one, but I thought it would be fun to point out that the real animal, you can see the neck here is extraordinary. On the real animal, we had an animal walking around with a neck that was 40 feet long, just the neck. Now my house is 40 feet long. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about an alien world of wonder that we went through and then it all came crashing down 66 million years ago. All right, let me put up the slides. And we're here tonight, not only to ask questions of dinosaurs to be, but to review some of the questions that have been asked and answered. We're lucky, you and I, because we live in a golden age of dinosaur discovery. Not only are there more scientists at work on dinosaurs right now than ever, but the scientists that are working on this topic outnumber all of the previous scientists that have ever lived. So, their discoveries are coming at us, a new dinosaur a week, something like that, where if you had been a researcher in the 1980s, one a month, if that. So here we go. What we're going to cover tonight are some of the things we know about dinosaurs, some of the things we never thought we would learn, you know, partly because we didn't know we could ask a question like that, how they died, you may know that, and can we bring them back, which is always a topic after the uh, Jurassic Park movies. Okay, let's start with a quiz. I'm gonna show pictures of four animals and only one of them is a dinosaur. So you'll have to answer for yourself and then I'll point it out in case I need to. Here we go. This is a pterosaur. Is it also a dinosaur? How about this? Crocodiles? How about a penguin? One of these animals is actually a dinosaur, and the answer, of course, is the penguin. All birds that you see out there stomping around and flying through the trees all of them are dinosaurs. These other animals are related to dinosaurs. They're in a group called archosaurs. Dinosaurs are in that group also. But dinosaurs are a group of their own. And to recognize one, you can look for six different traits. Actually, there are more than this, but to keep it simple. For example, if you're holding a dinosaur skull in your hand, there's a whole, can everyone see my cursor? Okay, good. 
There's a hole between the eye and the nostril. There are more holes at the back of the skull behind the eyeballs. The ankles on dinosaurs can only swing back and forth. They cannot rock sideways. Uh, this number five is talking about the legs of dinosaurs are under their bodies. So the legs actually support the weight. In the backbone, there are three or more vertebrae as part of the pelvis. And the most common signal that you're holding a dinosaur in your hand is a hole in the socket that the femur, the thigh bone fits into. So the next time you're cooking a chicken, look for all of those traits because they're diagnostic. So here's one now. This is Coelophysis. There have been many of them dug up in New Mexico, in the United States, and in Africa. Coelophysis was a very early dinosaur, that is in the Triassic period, over 200 million years ago. And notice, this is something that's come out only in the last few years, notice that he's covered in feathers. It's very exciting. So his legs are under the body to support him. He's long and skinny. You can see there's a depression in front of his eyes. So he's got all the characteristics that make him a dinosaur. And I, I'd like to point out that whenever you see a human being, it's there for scale only. Every once in a while, I see signs of somebody that wants us to believe that humans have met dinosaurs. So unless it's a bird, it's not true. So what did people think when they first started finding these huge bones that we know are dinosaurs? Like this. This is a scientist in a warehouse of big bones, and you can see that these thigh bones are the same size as his body. The first people that found bones of that size recognized from human skeletons what part of a body they were. And so this started legends growing about giant humans that used to walk around or still are, you know, someplace else. Not only were there supposed to be giant humans, but other fossils people got confused with and thought they were part of uh, humans. For example, the top two fossils look like hearts. The name is actually anthropocardites, which means human hearts. They could just be random fossils, but they're definitely not hearts. This guy is called a kidney stone. Oops, let me go back. Come on. There we go. Kidney stone, but it's not. Fossils that might look like a foot are definitely not. And this one is named Scrotum Humanum because somebody thought it looked like a penis that got broken in half and those would be the testicles. It turns out it's a thigh bone. It's another femur. Early drawings and pictures of what dinosaurs look like Scientists at the time recognized that they were related to lizards somehow, and so the diagrams had them squirting their legs out to the side, which would be impossible because their bodies were so large. Also notice that they had the tail dragging in the mud. We now know that that's not true. But things got better. For example, in the 1850s, there was a crystal palace built in London for an exhibition from art and crafts and industry around the world. And these dinosaurs were built just for that exhibit. They're still there in Hyde Park in London and you can see them and the government maintains them. One of the jaws fell off recently and they had to go in and repair it. These animals and the statues are so big that 
uh, one scientist who was a leading dinosaur researcher, one of the first, had one of them hollowed out and he put a dining room table inside and they had a conference right there inside their iguanodon. Finally, the art caught up with the reality. And this is a famous painting by Charles Knight. Notice the date, it's still in the 19th century. But people began to get the idea that these might be animals that were much more active than had been shown before. And we now know that this is closer to reality. Very dynamic, exciting picture. Okay, one question that gets asked, why were all the dinosaurs so big? Well, this man is holding a chunk of amber. And this one came from Borneo, as you know, an island uh, near Asia. And inside that amber, by the way, amber is a fossilized chunk of tree sap, like from a pine tree. And as the sap flows down the tree, whatever is there and gets stuck in it will get trapped inside and then the sap hardens into this stone. On this one, they polished it, looked inside, and son of a gun if they didn't find feathers very fine feathers. And the overall picture showed that this was clearly the tail of a dinosaur. And we now know that these dinosaurs had feathers. But if you look closely over here on the left, there are two ants also trapped in this. So ant people were excited because they get to track the evolution of how ants changed from 100 million years ago to today. So this tail, what the heck is going on here? An artist showed that the tail of this animal would be connected to something like this. We know it's a theropod, so it had the claws and the three toes on its feet. Notice he's eating a beetle. So this is a dinosaur that's relatively small, maybe the size of your cat. And some of them were much smaller than this. Some of the pictures I'm going to show tonight are of dinosaurs that were four inches long. Here's a close-up. These are very fine feathers, and while they resemble some downy feathers of modern birds, they're much simpler. Also trapped in amber are ticks. So we know that dinosaurs had some of the same problems that we do, and they probably had bacterial diseases passed on by ticks. Okay, so when did dinosaurs live? This timeline starts at 300 million years ago and ends with humans. This line for the arrow representing when humans evolved, the line is too fat. You could not see a line that represented how long humans have been on Earth on this chart. So the green period in here represents the amount of time that our famous dinosaurs, excluding birds, lived. And there have been modifications. For example, at 228 million years ago, that's too recent. Uh, we're finding dinosaurs now at least 10 million years older than that. And of course, if you count birds, they are still alive. So dinosaurs have been with us for over 230 million years. It's just amazing. Where do you find them? These red dots are fossil locations all over the world. You can see a heavy concentration here in the Western United States but many really spectacular fossils are coming out of South America. Europe is so packed with people that wherever you find fossils, somebody lives nearby, so they're more likely to get found. A lot of fossils now in Africa, Australia, and I'll be talking about some of them from China because they are spectacular. So what kinds of dinosaurs are they? 
the traditional classification says, and if you're not familiar with a cladogram, it works like this. There was an original dinosaur, say, there we go. And as more and more of them grew and bred with each other, they split into two groups. So the first group would be what we call Ornithischia. And I'll try not to use too many of these big names, but Ornithischia includes groups like this Triceratops that people are familiar with. The second group, as more and more animals appeared, they split into two groups, including the sauropods, like my Mementosaur that I introduced at the beginning, and some of the more famous dinosaurs like T-Rex in the group called theropods. So let's start by looking at some of the dinosaurs in this group called Ornithischia. You're looking at Triceratops, try for three, and he's got these two huge horns over the eyes and one on his nose. Here's one of his relatives. Notice that he has no horn on the nose, but two over the eyes. Here's one that has the two horns over the eyes, and the ones on the frill behind his neck are pointed down, and they don't seem to be very useful if you're going to try to intimidate another dinosaur. The truth is, there are so many of this group, they're called ceratopsians, that it boggles the mind. Look at these. And you can find almost any variant that you could imagine. Like, here's a guy with only a horn on his nose and it's pointed down. Once again, it's hard to figure what use that would be. They all have horns of some kind and they all have the fringes behind their head. And the fringe would have protected their neck if they were being attacked by a big predator. But it's thought that they also were very useful in attracting mates or in recognition of species. So let's see, is there another interesting one here? Yeah, I like these guys with the sideways horns. It's hard to figure what they could do with them. Here's another page just to show you that there are a lot of different species of these animals. How about this guy at the top row? He's got a lot of horns on this top fringe of his, but they're all pointed down. Where the guy next to him, there's no question that you don't want to get in an argument with this guy. Dangerous animals. It's been known for a long time that in the wild, the plant eaters have to be either dangerous or they have to run fast because in the, in the wild, they are the animals that would be eaten by those theropods. So this group has solved the danger problem. Not only did they have horns, but it's thought that they were really aggressive. Part of the explanation for how many different varieties there are is at the time there was an ocean here in the middle of the United States and Canada and Mexico. And Triceratops lived on what we're calling Laramidia, which was a continent island off by itself. And as you can see, between Mexico and northern Alaska, there would be a huge range of habitats, deserts, forests, marshes, a little bit of everything. So that causes variety. And the ocean would have risen and fallen quite a bit. And so there was plenty of impetus for these animals to change over time and form a lot of different varieties. Here's one of the reasons they were uh, so successful. This is a slice through the face of a Triceratops. So the drawing is inside the face of the animal. And look especially at these teeth. They act like scissors. So here's the lower jaw. When it rises up like your lower jaw, the teeth would gnash together like scissors. Not only would that allow it to eat really tough food, but these teeth would replace themselves constantly through the life of this animal. So they could eat 
branches on trees and grind it up with these teeth. And then they had big bellies so that bacteria could help them break it down. Here's some more in this Ornithischian group. This is a group of animals that's more common than Triceratops. Notice that they have that odd small head and neck compared to the size of their bodies and a really wide mouth for leaning over and munching on grass. This is a hadrosaur. The name of this one is Edmontosaurus from Canada. Hadrosaurs have a similar battery. And if we could watch them chew their food today, as the, as the lower jaw would rise up and the teeth would grind together, you'd see the jaw bend out to the side, very different from the mammals that we're familiar with. Here's a favorite, Parasaurolophus. It's another hadrosaur, like that last picture. And remember, the human is here only for comparison. So today we'd call this an elephant. So these animals were not small. But of course, on this one, it's the head that sticks out. And this horn is hollow. You can see a nasal opening. So it's hollow all the way back to the tip and it winds around and is hollow through here. The thinking is that it's not strong enough to be a combat weapon. So it didn't butt heads with this, but very likely they, the, the soft tissue that didn't fossilize would make a noise. And this thing would act like a trombone and send the honking or whatever the sound is across the valley. You could hear them from miles away. We're still talking about ornithischians and it includes a group called notosaurs. These are the tanks of the dinosaur world. Look at all the armor down its back and tail. The head is armored. The spikes on its neck are two feet long. And because of one very special and lucky fossil, we know more about them than we expected to. For example, this drawing has it dark on top and the belly is light colored. We know that to be true because we found a fossil of this dinosaur that you could see the skin and that doesn't happen very often. So here's a picture looking down on the head. There's the head and you can see these neck spines. The spines are made of keratin like your fingernails and so they can rot and usually they rot away over time, which is why you only see skeletons on most fossils. Here's a side view, a close up of one of those spines. And then finally, the entirety of this fossil. This came from Canada. Uh, heavy equipment was operating in the tar sands up there and hit something solid. Most of it was sand that this guy was working in. So he flipped it over and could see that something unusual was going on. So they hauled it off to a museum and it took a man, his name was Walker, took him five years to clean this thing up so that you could see what he actually looked like. The name of this fossil, are you ready? Borealopelta walkeri. And so the species name came from the guy that cleaned him up and it took him five years of patient work to do it. By the way, the stomach contents for this dinosaur were still there. And so this tank ate ferns. Looked like he lived in a forest and they found a lot of charcoal in with the ferns he ate. So it looks like whenever there was a forest fire and the plants started to grow back, this would be one of the animals that would go in and start munching on the fresh uh, plant life. The reason this fossil was preserved, they think, is that as it was dying, it walked into the ocean. And so it died here. And like all bodies, when you die, your body starts to swell up with gas because there's bacteria in your gut. Not just dinosaurs, but 
us too. So it bloated so heavily that it floated, flipped upside down and floated out into the ocean. And as its body kept expanding with gases, eventually it exploded, it popped like a balloon and it sank upside down into the mud. The mud cut off the oxygen so it couldn't rot and very quickly it was covered up with more mud and that's how you preserve an animal. We're very lucky. Okay, here is what may be the most common dinosaur of all. It's a little fella called Psittacosaurus. And notice it's got little spines down its back. Some people are thinking that because they're made out of keratin, they may be a more primitive kind of feather. And if that's true, then it suggests that maybe all dinosaurs had feathers. That hasn't been proven, but maybe, which is interesting. Finally, how about Pachycephalosaurus? This guy had five inches of bone on the top of its skull. You can tell it's related to Triceratops because it's got this ring of horns around its neck. But of course, this was the battering ram of the dinosaur days. He had a beak here, so he was a plant eater, and about the size of a horse. Would have been exciting to watch the males competing for females, if that's what was going on. Okay, let's look at another group now. We took a tour of Ornithischia. Let's go down and look at theropods. For many people, the most popular kinds of dinosaurs. There are two dinosaurs represented here. The biggest one is definitely a theropod, but a lot of people did not know what to do with this guy. It's named Herrerasaurus after a person who owned the land where the fossil came from. And Herrerasaurus had some differences, so scientists weren't sure what group to put him in. I'll talk more about him later, but let's look at theropods. And when you see a T-Rex, you'll know we're in that same group. This is a good time to talk about Xing Shu. He's a Chinese scientist. He wanted to be a physicist. When it was time to go to college, he decided he wanted to study physics. But the government in China said, no, you don't. You want to study paleontology. And he said, well, okay. It worked out because he is now, if not the top scientist in the world regarding dinosaurs, He's certainly up there with the best ever. Xing Shu has discovered and described at least a hundred, I don't know how many by now, but when I was reading about him, at least a hundred species of dinosaur that he somehow had a connection to. So let's look at some of his discoveries. Uh, first, notice that in China, there are these six red dots are locations where significant fossils have been found. And the most famous of all is right up here in the northeast of China. It's called Liaoning. In that area, farmers who would be out working in the field could flip over a rock and hit it with a hammer and come up with a fossil that would change how we think about dinosaurs. That happened in 1996. And I'll show you a picture of the dinosaur that guy found. All four of these dinosaurs, there's a very large one here at the bottom and three small ones at the top, all of them are covered in feathers, which is part of the revolution that came out of the Chinese fossils. The three guys on top are all small. They're four inches long and they all have different significant parts of their bodies that taught us something about small dinosaurs. This one is Zhao Tingjia, and Xing Shu says this may be the first bird. He's older than Archaeopteryx, the famous fossil that was found in Europe. This is Anchiornis. In Chinese museums, there are hundreds of examples of this one kind of bird-like dinosaur. He couldn't fly. None of these guys could fly 
but they could glide, partly because they were small. So there was a group of dinosaurs that got smaller over time, and because they were covered with feathers, it became easy for them to change over time and experiment with flying. Like this one. This is Microraptor, and you can see he's got arm wings and leg wings. And of course, that long bony tail that dinosaurs had. He couldn't flap and fly like birds today, but Xing Shu took a model of this dinosaur to the United States and they put him in one of NASA's wind tunnels to try to figure out how all these feathers worked. And it turns out the best way to glide would be to hold your arms out and put the back legs together and then steer with that tail and he could glide a long distance because he was very lightweight. Finally, look at this guy, U. Tyrannus. And as you can tell from the name, he's in the family of dinosaurs that's related to T-Rex. Compare it to a human and he's enormous. Covered with feathers, which was, has been a, a fascinating discovery of the last 30 years. There's one more freaky thing about this guy. Not only is he big and dangerous and aggressive, but if you met up with him in an alley, he might very well have some buddies with him. It looks like they hunted in packs. How's that for scary? Three of this dinosaur's skeletons were found close together, and one interpretation of that was that they hunted in packs. Still on theropods, it'd be good to look at a couple of the fossils that Xing Shu and others have described. And looking at this one, you can get an idea of the spectacular detail. I mean, if you look at the delicacy of these bones, they really stand out. And this gray area is feathers. You can see that the feathers all meet at the back, just like on modern birds when they're nesting. This other fossil, I don't see how you can beat this for detail. Look at the arm feathers. To just pick out one feather and you can even see the fibers of the feather. These are approaching modern bird feathers in their complexity. You know it's a dinosaur though because it has claws on its wings and if you could see the whole fossil it has a long bony tail and teeth which no birds today have. The detail on these fossils is one of the things that makes them so famous. So in what is now China, 150 million years ago, the land had a lot of water, a lot of rivers and ponds and ocean bays, and it had volcanoes. So if vo a volcano was exploding and poison gases killed an animal, it would fall in the water and then get covered up with ash, which would preserve it and prevent rot because bacteria couldn't get to it. All right, here's a theropod diagram that's showing how dinosaurs invented wings. And I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, except to point out a couple of the steps. This first one, this first drawing at the top is an arm of a dinosaur. Here he is. This is called Sinosauropteryx. There's a picture coming up of him. And it's a typical dinosaur theropod arm. On the other end of these drawings is a modern bird wing. So this is the wing from a crow. The question is, how did you get from a dinosaur arm to wings? Well, first of all, this entire group of dinosaurs was covered with feathers. So the feathers changed over time, but there were other tricks. Like, look at the second drawing here. This is the arm of a velociraptor. Remember him from the movies? There's a drawing of him at the bottom. Velociraptor had the ability to fold his hand close to his arm. That's very useful if you're chasing a smaller animal and you want to grab it. Well, it turns out that as birds and wings evolved, 
it's very useful to fold your wing up against your body when you're on the ground. And if you watch a bird do that, you can thank Velociraptor. So step by step, these arms, these upper arms got more and more complex. You can find the, the oldest fossil we know of that could flap like a bird was this one. And Archaeopteryx has often been called the first bird, but he was missing some things from modern birds and so on until you get to a modern crow here at the end of the story. Here's something we didn't know we could ask. Is it possible to know the colors of dinosaurs? I mean, after all, they've been buried in mud for 200 million years and the color would surely go away. It turns out that scientists that were studying colors on birds saw these structures under the microscope. Now, these new scientists weren't the first people to see them. Long ago, dinosaurs under the microscope would show little BBs like this. You can all see the round structures. And then over here on the right, you see some that are sausage shaped. Well, bacteria look just like that. And so it was thought these are bacteria. They're tiny. You know, once again, we're looking under a microscope. They're tiny, so we don't need to study them any further. Well, scientists that were studying the colors of modern birds saw these same structures under a microscope. And it turns out that these are called, look at the name up at the top, melanosomes. And you have melanosomes in your hair and other body parts to give them color. So it turns out the sausage shapes produce a dark color, the black and brown that you see in feathers. And the BB shapes would produce the color, a, kind of a light orange, the color of ginger. Here's our friend Sinosauropteryx again. You can see this is not a bird. It is clearly a dinosaur. He's got the claws and the teeth and the deadly foot claws. He's covered in feathers and they are this ginger color. This is those BB shaped melanosomes. This was the dinosaur that freaked everybody out in 1996 when it was discovered in China because the fossil showed that the entire animal was covered with feathers. And th by then, that was the thing that made up scientists' minds that birds were dinosaurs. So this is the guy that helped with that discovery. You can see the feathers under a microscope and that, that's clearly what they are. So not only do we know what this dinosaur looked like, but we know the color of his feathers. Here's another one. Anchiornis is that bird-like dinosaur that had several hundred different fossils in the Chinese museums. These black and white stripes are accurate. This fringe of ginger colored feathers on the back of his head, that's realistic. This is a new fossil and you're looking at the actual dinosaur fossil still in the box as it came in from the field. And when they studied it, nowadays they x-ray these things and, and they don't have to bust up the, the rock and, and worry about damaging it. But an artist showed that this dinosaur was kind of like an early version of a penguin. You know it's a dinosaur, it's not a penguin because he has that long bony tail. You can see the claws again on his little stubby wings. He's got teeth. And look at his feet, claws, and this one claw that sticks up, it's called the killer claw because animals that have that could jump on the side of another dinosaur and sort of rip it open. So this is a can opener claw. But because of these features, it was decided that this dinosaur probably spent most of its time in the water and could sort of swim with those stubby wings. But he's the second water dinosaur ever discovered. I'll pause just a minute and have you remember for yourself 
What is the most famous water dinosaur of all? It was in one of the movies, one of the Jurassic Park movies. Here he is, Spinosaurus. Uh, here's a human for scale. And if this human was really wearing scuba gear, he needs to turn around and swim the other way because just the head of this dinosaur was bigger than my body. I'm six feet tall. This is longer than six feet. We don't know what the sail is for. There's lots of ideas. What would you do with a sail like that if you spend all your time in the water? But huge. If T-Rex was 40 feet long, this guy was more like 50. And probably there were some that were bigger. In the last couple of years, a new one of a new fossil of this was found in Morocco, and the tail looked much more like the tail of a crocodile than you see here. So it clearly swam in the water, and there were lots of big fishes that it could feast on. How about a mystery? This is a theropod fossil, and this is all that was found of it. And the people that cleaned it up were thinking, oh my gosh, we have here the biggest theropod meat-eating son of a gun that ever lived. That was in 1965. It is a theropod, but nobody could recognize what kind. And then in 2014, a new fossil showed up. And boy, was it weird. Look at this. This is Dinochirus. It's big. Remember, these arms are eight feet long, but what, a heck, what is it doing with this tiny little cartoon head? And look at that hump on his back. We have no idea. People are trying to figure it out, and someday we'll have a, a good analysis of Dinochirus and figure it out. But it turns out there was another mystery related to this. Look at this guy. These arms are longer than eight feet, and if it had the claws fully grown as it was in life, the claws would be three feet long. So once again, I'm six feet. These claws would be as long as my legs. It's enormous. So is this the greatest killer dinosaur of all time? No, nope. it's another plant eater. Huge. One good reason to get big like this is to have a big gut so that bacteria can help you break down the plant material that you take in. So here are those three foot long claws, which would be useful in defending yourself if you're a giant like this, but they're also useful for pulling down branches and getting lots of leaf material into the mouth. Therizinosaurus. Here comes an artist rendering of Therizinosaurus. And in this neat kind of story, this picture is showing, these are oviraptors. They look like giant birds. They're taller than I am at over six feet. And you can see on the ground that these oviraptors were living in a community of nests. And here comes this gigantic Therizinosaurus stomping around. And so the oviraptors are freaking out trying to get this guy out of there so that he doesn't smash all their babies. Cool picture. All of these dinosaurs are covered in feathers, if I haven't said that. So what about T-Rex? You all know what he looks like. Here is the Tyrannosaurus rex that lived in the what is now the Western United States. But it's important to know that there's a whole family of them. Like this is Tarbosaurus, uh, a couple of fossils of this guy have been unearthed in Asia and China. One of them was dug up illegally, assembled as a fossil, and somebody tried to auction it off and probably would have made millions of dollars. But I believe the country was Mongolia said, hey, that fossil, we know where that fossil came from. It belongs to us. And so they claimed it and got the fossil back and somebody was going to be real disappointed that they didn't make a fortune. That's a serious problem, by the way, amateurs getting in there and messing up fossils that scientists want to work on. So tyrannosaurs were not always big. Look down here at the very bottom. 
Here's a nano Tyrannus and a human in this picture is about the same height. So if you could get him to keep his mouth closed, you might be able to put a saddle on this guy and ride him around. But fortunately they've been dead for a while. Bite force. There has never been an animal on earth, at least that we've discovered so far, that could bite as hard as a T-Rex. What we have measured on living animals like alligators, T-Rex beats them all. And after this study was done that you see the picture of, the evidence was reevaluated and it looks like T-Rex could bite at least twice as hard as this study. In other words, he could bite your car and crunch it up. And we know that because of this fossil. Oh, not this one. This is a fun picture of people having fun with their dinosaurs at a museum. But look at this fossil. This is the pelvis of a Triceratops. And you see these marks here? They're blown up on the right. And these depressions fit exactly with the jaw of a Tyrannosaurus rex. Now you might think, well, okay, he bit into bone, so what? The bone we're talking about is this bone. And since a Triceratops was as big as an elephant or bigger, that means we're talking about a bone that is several inches thick and it looked like a T-Rex could just break it apart. There's been nothing like that ever since. Okay, the last group of dinosaurs are the sauropods. Here they're called sauropodomorphs, and the morph means shape. So let's take a look at some of these guys. You know you're looking at a sauropod if it has this distinctive body shape. A tiny little head compared to the body, long neck and tail, an enormous body, and very thick legs to support all the weight. Sauropods. Here's a recent one that was a partial skeleton dug up in, of all places, Antarctica. So they lived, dinosaurs lived from the South Pole to the North Pole. On the North Slope of Alaska, there's everything from theropods to plant eaters, and many of them, it looks like, spent the entire year up there. Of course, it wasn't as cold as Alaska is now. How about this? The name of this dinosaur is Argentinosaurus. And please notice that it is 120 feet long. I think I mentioned my house is 40 feet long. So my house would fit on just the neck. And then if you could copy my house, it would fit just on the body. And another one of my house would be like the tail. That's just incredible. So look at this little human. If he walked over here and jumped up and down, he might be able to touch the belly of this dinosaur. The estimate is 100 tons in weight, and it was not the biggest. Believe it or not, in South America right now, they're studying vertebrae that are even bigger than this Argentinosaurus. This is a drawing that they, different groups will produce for all the different groups of dinosaurs, and it shows some of the variety. So you can see some of the sauropods are much smaller, but the biggest are the biggest land animals that have ever lived. Approaching the size, believe it or not, of whales. Blue whales are clearly the largest animal that has ever been on Earth. And some of these dinosaurs are getting close to that size. This is a Brachiosaurus from Jurassic Park. You can see that his front legs are quite a bit longer than some of those other sauropods to get him up higher in the trees. Look at the tiny little peg-like teeth. So these dinosaurs were no good at chewing. What they had to do is bite a branch of a tree and just strip down and rip off all of the tiny branches and leaves and swallow it whole. But because their body is so big, they could pack it in and let the bacteria work on 
digestion uh, in addition to their enzymes. Some of the species could stand on their back legs and tail like this to get up even higher. And oops, come back. There he is. And this is another one of these sauropod heads. This one is from Brontosaurus, but you can see once again, those peg-like teeth up front that would strip the leaves off. I'm gonna answer this question, why were there so many in a minute? But notice on this apatosaur, there are two ridges running down his back. They were covered in cartilage that acted kind of like ropes. And the, those ropes would run over the shoulders and down the back and kind of acted like a crane to help lift up this enormous neck. Remember, some of these necks are 40 feet long. This is a picture of one of those vertebra with two knobs at the top to show where those crane ropes would go. Okay, the question here is why were there so many? And that has come up for people studying sauropods because they were finding way too many fossils in the same area. Remember, these are gigantic animals and it looked like there were too many of them in a small forest or a bushy area. It looked like they would eat all the plants and then starve to death. So people interested in that would study the anatomy of these dinosaurs and come up with a chart like this. So let's do a little interpretation here. You can see a couple of color patterns. And on the top of this chart, notice these blue diamond shapes. Those are different species of sauropods. And over here on the table, it says those are diplodocy. Namely, the dinosaur that started this, the first one found was diplodocus. It had a long whip-like tail. It looks like all the sauropods that are related to Diplodocus ate at the same part of the forest. So that might be, say, in the middle of the trees. Down here is the Brachiosaur group, these triangles, and they, of course, ate at the tops of trees. And so these different groups of huge dinosaurs were only eating at their own special part of the forest, and that's called partitioning. So if they weren't competing with each other for the same parts of the plants, that means you could have more dinosaurs in the same area. And so this is part of the explanation for why there were so many sauropods. Okay, here's a question. Does everybody agree on the classification that we've been looking at here tonight? There was a new analysis that came out in 2017. So here's what everybody has been classifying dinosaurs as since we've been talking about dinosaurs. Remember, Ornithischia, often a group by itself, and then sauropods and theropods are more closely related to each other. In 2017, a group of scientists with a graduate student, his last name was Baron went to museums all over the world and measured sometimes 400 different parts of the dinosaur skeletons that were in these museums. They put all those measurements into the computer and said to the computer, tell me, based on all these measurements, what dinosaurs are more closely related to each other? And they came up with a different scheme. Notice that uh, sauropods used to be closely related to theropods. Now they're in a separate group. And ornithischians and theropod, I'm sorry, yeah, theropods are in the same group and they got new names. There's a strange dinosaur here, Herrerasauridae, named after the person that owned the land. But this dinosaur had some body features that you don't find in other dinosaurs. And after a long time of studying it, it looks like Herrerasaurus was more closely related to sauropods than anything else. 
Now, not all the people studying dinosaurs agree with this, and it'll probably say, take some time for a lot more measurement and a lot more arguing before they come up and stick to one or the other of these plans. But it does show you that these things aren't fixed. As soon as somebody comes up with a new idea how to study dinosaurs, things can change. Finally, we all know how they died, right? This is a big rock slamming into the Caribbean Sea. Made a big splash. Now, when I say big rock, I live in Eureka, California, and six miles up the coast is Arcata, where this museum is. That's about six miles. This rock was that big, six miles in estimate. It's the size of a mountain, in other words, and it was going many, many times faster than a bullet. So when it hit the earth, we're talking destruction here. So this is just a drawing to help get the idea across. When the asteroid hit in what is now Mexico, it went 20 miles into the earth. The asteroid itself was destroyed and turned into little melted blobs of glass that went up into the atmosphere and spread thousands of miles away. This wave you see here is not something that you can surf. This wave is a mile high. You can still see a ring of sand around the Caribbean Sea left over from this destruction. So remember the melted glass particles? They're tiny little drops of hot glass shot up into the air and the wind spread them around. And within the first couple of hours after this disaster, they came down and heated up the atmosphere to 500 degrees. Now you may know you can't survive under 500 degrees. So a lot of the dinosaurs were cooked and those little glass particles started fires. And it's hard to imagine now, but the entire North American continent burned. It was on fire. Everything from New York City to Los Angeles burning. And that put a lot of soot up into the air, which blocked the sunlight. And now the plants can't grow because they're not getting sunlight. And this went on for weeks and months. Everything died except, of course, the examples that we know about. Mammals survived. There were three different kinds of birds uh, when this asteroid hit. Two of them went extinct immediately. And the only one that survived became all the birds that we know of today. But wait a minute, you might have heard about the Deccan steppes. This is India, and this upper map is the world as it is today. So in India, at the same time that asteroid hit, there was a huge bunch of volcanoes that poured out lava. And this went on for a long time, thousands, many thousands of years. And of course, poison gases would have come into the air and people said, well, couldn't that have killed off the dinosaurs? Well, this bottom diagram has several interesting features to further that argument. For example, over here on the right is Mexico. This is where the asteroid hit. And remember, this, is, this rock is huge and it's going very fast, something like 20,000 miles an hour. When it hit, the entire earth would jiggle like a bowl of jelly. And all of those ripples and waves would come together on the opposite side of the earth, where Indonesia and some of the uh, other islands are today. If there's a weakness in the floor of the ocean, it would crack open. And do you see this V shape down here that's red? That's what happened. Uh, when the asteroid hit, new lava poured out in unprecedented quantities and poison gases in the air. So the scientists that did this study said, well, this had to have helped kill the dinosaurs. And sure enough, you can still find this mountain of lava on the ocean near India. And this chart is showing, if you look at the bottom scale right here at 65 and a half million years ago, 
the date of that lava and the size of it all match up exactly with the asteroid. So once this study was done, you know, it started the argument over again. Was it the asteroid? Was it the volcanoes? Scientists are pretty much agreed now that these volcanoes would have made life worse for the dinosaurs, but it was definitely the asteroid that killed them and not the volcanoes. It's kind of a one-two punch, but the asteroid is the big killer. Finally, we can ask questions about dinosaurs by little imprints they leave behind. Here's a little imprint. This man is laying next to a highlighted section of rock that is the footprint of a sauropod. So we're talking big here. This man is digging out a rock on the property of NASA in Florida. NASA was going to build a new building on the space center there. And they came across this rock and dug it out. And this is what they found. Here's the rock at the bottom. And the scientists that studied it saw that this thing was completely covered in footprints and the variety of animals that left those footprints astonished everybody that could see it. For example, this is a theropod. See the red guy up at the top? These red footprints are from theropods. This huge dinosaur is a sauropod, obviously. And so this big footprint would have been from him. You can match the color. Remember the tank dinosaur, the notosaur that, was, that sank into the ocean? These are some of his footprints over here. Here's a, a flying creature. I'm, <laughs> I, I know the name of that, di that not dinosaur. Here are his footprints. And surprise to everyone, but there's a little mammal there and some of his footprints ran through this same area. We don't know what was going on here, but it had to be mud like at the edge of a pond. And so these various animals came by to drink. And then it would have to be covered up quickly and over time turned into rock. Amazing. Paluxy, Texas. This may be the most famous dinosaur footprint example anywhere. This is a, a creek in Texas and the water flowed over these dinosaur footprints, making it obvious that something was going on at the bottom here. You can see a human in this photograph from like a hundred years ago. Part of this trackway was taken out of the creek and is now in the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And here's an example of what that looks like. So in this part of the trackway, the big footprints would be our friend, the sauropod. And the smaller footprints, look, over, look right here, you can see that the theropod is on top of the sauropod footprint. So that means this guy was following behind the sauropod and probably, if he was very ambitious, probably was thinking, I think I can take him. So this may be fossil evidence of a hunt going on. But of course, like everything, it's under dispute. Finally, can we bring dinosaurs back? Ever since Jurassic Park, we've wanted to ask that question. Uh, one of the more famous dinosaur hunters is Jack Horner, and he says, we know that it would not work the way it was in the movies, but if you really wanted to bring a dinosaur back, look at your chicken. Because chickens, since they're dinosaurs, they still have the genes that produce teeth. And when chickens are embryos inside an egg, there's a part of their development where they start to grow teeth and then they're reabsorbed and disappear. In that way, those genes are now dormant for teeth. Also, you don't get long arms, but perhaps the genes are there and maybe the genetics for a long bony tail are there. So if you pursue this line of investigation, you may be able to take our friends, the chickens. By the way, you know how many chickens there are on earth? 50 billion. 
Now, there are 8 billion human beings. So do the math. That's a whole lot of chickens for every human being on Earth. Anyway, take your chicken, investigate his genetics, and it's at least possible that you could turn it back into a velociraptor since velociraptors are very closely related to modern birds. All right. This is not a bird, but it's one of those fun models that you can buy everywhere. This one was on eBay that I saw a picture. Imagine back in the day, this animal would be six to 10 feet tall. You can see he's covered with feathers. And then unfortunately he died. But in one of the miracles of preservation in China, he was very quickly covered up with volcanic ash. And scientists are now looking for things like this, but look what they found. These are cells. You're not supposed to find any cells in dinosaurs. For Pete's sake, they've been dead for a hundred million years. They're supposed to have turned into rocks. What are they doing with cells inside there? The pink stuff here is a stain. And so they clearly are showing cells and even a nucleus. Now, the people that work on this know that DNA only lasts at most a million years. So there's probably not any DNA in there. But we've also said, remember, that you can't find real cellular tissue in these fossils. And here it is. So they're going to keep looking. This is a dead mouse fossilized. And there's a picture of the dead mouse up there. And a group of scientists are using x-rays to look at different kinds of metal in fur and body tissues. And these different colors are showing that they can start to analyze colors and molecular makeup of dinosaurs in the same way they're doing on this mouse. So there's lots of different techniques going on. Finally, this is, look up here in the upper left, this is a red blood cell. This came out of a dinosaur, another theropod, and that is not supposed to happen. But son of a gun, there it is. So we have blood cells, but no DNA. So whether we can rebuild the world of dinosaurs or not, there are amazing discoveries being made and in your lifetime, there may be some really fantastic discoveries. All right, so I'm almost finished here. How did dinosaurs survive for more than 200 million years? For one thing, there were several episodes of global warming. And most of the time that there were these big dinosaurs, it was way hotter than it's ever been while human beings have been around. So one idea is that look at this theropod and this reddish area are the lungs and then these are air sacs. Now modern birds have those same air sacs and they breathe completely different from you and I. Let's take a look. When this bird breathes in, follow this blue air, it goes past the lungs to air sacs at the bottom of its abdomen. Then when the bird breathes out, the blue air starts to move into its lungs. And the question is, well, so what? Why is that an advantage? It means that air is flowing through their lungs in one direction only. Now think about how you breathe. You breathe in and the oxygen that's in there, that's all you get from that breath. And then you have to wait until you breathe out again before you get more air. In birds and those dinosaurs, the air flowed through their lungs constantly, meaning they get more oxygen. They could produce more energy for doing things like flying. Okay, so that's a cool trick. Finally, dinosaurs can teach us something about diversity. There are 900 or so known species of dinosaurs and the estimate is that's only one fourth of the total. So something in the order of 3,500 of the dinosaurs back in the Mesozoic, 100 
million years ago. Well, let's compare that to the dinosaurs that are alive today. The Natural History Museum in New York City estimates there are 10,000, more than 10,000 species of birds alive today. Well, how does that compare to our group, the mammals? Twice as many bird species as there are mammals. So you could make the argument that if you measure it this way, the dinosaurs are still the most dominant kind of animals on Earth. Of course, you can't make that argument now that humans have covered the planet, but the diversity of species is quite a feat. Finally, dinosaurs have showed us what it means to be alive at a time when the world was full of huge theropods hunting all day, every day, very colorful creatures that we've never seen, like a 10 foot tall ostrich completely covered with peacock feathers. You can imagine everybody was afraid, but life sure had to be exciting. By the way, this is a new tyrannosaur. Notice he's got a very long snout. So the nickname for this guy is the Pinocchio dinosaur. Okay, finally, it's time for the dinosaurs to say goodbye. There's an owl, a parrot, a bald eagle, and finally, the penguin that we started the talk with. I hope I'm close to the amount of time we had, but I appreciate you all being here and joining me for a talk of dinosaurs. Thank you, Elliot. We so appreciate your talk. I always learn a tremendous amount from you. Just really fascinating. I think we might have some questions too. You have a few minutes for a question and answer? You bet. Excellent. And anyone's welcome just to unmute and ask their question if they'd like. And Melinda, I think you had one in the chat. Maybe you want to start us off? Yeah, I think I actually have um, several. And if you see a face pop up behind me, Mark's... <laughs> In the clouds. <laughs> so we actually have more people here than what it looks like. Mark um, can fly. <laughs> um, I'm wondering, Elliot, because I know that you keep up on these things more than um, we do. What do you think might be the next change in the groupings of dinosaurs? Because I know these things are changing a lot. Hard to keep up on, it seems like, because it's it's just there's so many new fossils constantly yeah um coming out is there in in your back of your mind something that you think is going to change pretty soon well that study i mentioned from 2017 is a revolution in dinosaur taxonomy if it turns out that there's a consensus in the science field of dinosaurs then that will have been the revolution because since we've known about dinosaurs, we use that classification that I started with. And the Baron group has said it may be different. There's one other idea that comes up with classification, and it may be that both of those schemes are correct. For example, there, are, there have been events in evolution where a whole bunch of species pop into existence all at the same time. Seemingly, I mean, it may be, have been millions of years apart, but as far as we can tell, it could be that all these groups of dinosaurs just came into being at the same time, and that would be confusing as we try to classify them. So we don't know which of those is true right now. One more question, then I'll have somebody else have a chance. Okay. Um, so in my mind, kind of a linear thinker, and I know that's not really how evolution works, but um, it seems like maybe feathers came later and some of the things I've read, maybe like the later Cretaceous dinosaurs had feathers, but the earliest ones maybe didn't. What's your take on that? Have you found any um, papers that talk about like, you know, um, what's the one before Jurassic? Triassic dinosaurs with feathers? Yeah, there's, there's some evidence that there were feathers early on. And I mentioned Psittacosaurus, a small dinosaur that may have had feathers, which would indicate that even the earliest, the very first dinosaurs may have been feathers. 
And you have to keep saying things like maybe and almost, and we're not sure because we're not sure, but there are hints that come up like dinosaurs in completely different groups that had them. Even a pterosaur under a microscope, somebody got a good enough fossil that they could look at a pterosaur and instead of just skin, it looks like they were covered with tiny little feathers. Now that paper came out where somebody described feathers on pterosaurs, which are not dinosaurs. But if it's true, then that means archosaurs might have had feathers, which is a bigger group than dinosaurs, it includes dinosaurs, but it's bigger. Most of the people that have read that paper and argued with it disagree. So it could be that that, that pterosaur does not have feathers. But the jury is still out on just how extensive feathering was. For example, the American Museum of Natural History in New York just put up a beautiful model of Tyrannosaurus rex, the most recent model in existence. And while he's dangerous and drooling, this T-Rex, he's got a row of feathers down the back of his head and neck. So the consensus is that all the theropods had feathers. Now, big animals like T-Rex, when you're an adult, you don't need feathers because their bodies are so big, they have trouble getting rid of heat. Instead of trying to stay warm, their bodies are too hot and they have to find ways to get rid of heat. But they would still have feathers, say, on the back of their head or whatever. So it looks like feathers were extensive, but we're looking for more evidence, particularly from China, for just how common they were. Mm. Interesting. Thanks. Okay. More questions? Yeah, I have a question. Go ahead, Karen. You've talked about how the dinosaurs, there were so many of them, obviously, you know, they evolved and changed and regrouped. How do you go back even earlier? You know, the, the question of the chicken or the egg, uh, which comes first? Uh. You know, I, I could see the, you know, the, the, the little creepy crawlies in the water and the fish and the things like that. But when we see the, the images of these things creeping out of the water and becoming land animals, uh, at what point were they dinosaurs? That's a great question. And the answer is about as interesting as you could hope for. 250 million years ago, we, w we underwent the biggest extinction the earth has ever seen. 90 something percent of all species went extinct, at least in the oceans. And that's where most life was, was in the ocean. All, almost everything, was, that's as close as we've ever gotten to killing everything that was alive. And after that, not many creatures survived that, obviously, but when the Permian extinction was over, it's like all of these niches, all these environments were open, and so lots of new kinds of creatures came up. And the period of time after the Permian is called the Triassic. And during the Triassic, dinosaurs were invented and a whole bunch of other animals. The interesting part is that dinosaurs were just one of many and they were not the most important. There were archosaurs, they're called, related to modern crocodiles and alligators. Imagine an alligator that had long back legs and could outrun you and bite you in half, right? So animals like that were the dominant creatures of the Triassic. And then something happened. It's called the, the Carnian Pluvial. This will be in the quiz afterward. The Carnian Pluvial in the middle of the Triassic was a period of time where lots of volcanoes like in Alaska, what is now Alaska, were exploding. And so the earth went under another period of stress because these volcanoes were putting nasty gases out and so on. Because of their breathing ability, this is how the story goes, because of dinosaurs breathing trick, 
they outcompeted these other animals. Remember, dinosaurs, there was no way that you could predict that dinosaurs were going to dominate the earth because the competition was fierce. I mean, being chased by enormous alligators and several other varieties, these were, it was a nasty period of time. But when the volcanism hit and the dinosaurs had a special trick, they began to outcompete them. And then there was another extinction period at 200 million years ago. This is the end of the Triassic. All those other creatures went away. They disappeared. They could not stand the competition. And by then the dinosaurs were getting bigger and more dangerous and faster and filling lots of different ecological niches. And from then on, for the next 100 million years or so, dinosaurs ruled. And those are the pictures that we've been seeing tonight. Fascinating story. Next question. And, and Libby, did you have a question too? I think I saw a hand earlier. Um, yes, I did. I'll turn my camera on. Um, I actually had a couple of questions. Um, I also start with the shorter one first. At the beginning of the presentation, um, when you were talking about um, how humans in first interpreted the dinosaur bones, um, you said they were wrong about all of them. I was wondering if you knew what any of those bones uh, ended up being or actually are. Some of them were dinosaurs. Cool. And a lot of mythology came from fossils that people didn't understand. And if you've ever seen pictures of a griffin, you know what that is? It's a mythological creature with wings and a beak, right? It has a, a big animal we're talking about. So it had four legs, wings, and instead of teeth up front, it had a beak, like, like a bird beak that could chop up plants. And throughout mythology, griffins just seem to be appearing and with different purposes for different cultures. And then somebody was traveling in Mongolia and found the head of a ceratopsid emerging from a cliffside. And son of a gun, if it didn't look like a griffin, because that enormous fringe on the back of the head of a ceratopsian kind of looks like wings. And so depending on where these bones would show up out of cliffs or underground or whatever, people had to try to make sense out of it. And so giant human beings or a fossil that looked like a foot or whatever, and religion plays a part in here because one interpretation of how the earth got to be the way it is was that God made it so, right? We didn't have modern science. So the best explanation was, well, God wanted to produce fossils that looked like parts of humans. And then eventually humans were formed. And you had another question? Um, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, my second question is, I'm not sure if you've seen the um, post or pictures or whatever that say, if we drew modern animals, how we drew dinosaurs and they're all very um, creepy looking and they don't fully depict what the animal is. And I'm wondering if you think that that is actually wrong, like how we are describing dinosaurs, if we are missing a lot of those fleshy elements such as um, large muscles or um, just a lot of soft tissues that don't preserve well in fossils. Um, what's your take on that? Yeah, great question. And it, it kind of follows your first question because mm -hmm. when we didn't know what a dinosaur was, only your imagination could fill in the blanks. But now there are whole branches of science that are studying these animals. And for example, take a T-Rex skull, a close examination of the anatomy tells you not only where the muscles hook in, but how big the muscles are. And once you know how big the muscles are, you can estimate the power and the force behind them and estimate bite strength and things like that. And so similar things are happening with how massive they might be or how fast they can run or who could arm wrestle the next door neighbor better. All of those kinds of questions are being asked 
and PhDs are awarded to people who come up with examinations like that. And the detail, the just knowing the language that these people talk, not just anatomy, the names of the muscles, but the very minute details of muscle fibers and bone structure and how it got fossilized. Before, Jack Horner, for example, uh, runs the museum, the Dinosaur Museum in Montana. I'm, I'm forgetting the name of it. But he one day, he took a dinosaur skull and sawed it in half. And I watched an interview with him one time and he was laughing because he says, Nobody takes a dinosaur skull and cuts it in half. That's crazy. These things are priceless. But when he did that, he could look at minute structures in the bones. And what he ended up explaining was the dinosaur that we called a Tarbosaurus. Oh, I've got the name wrong. But anyway, two different kinds of Ceratopsians were actually the same species, but one was older than the other because the one that we called Triceratops was still growing. And the bone structures change just like on humans. They change as you get older. And so he was making the argument that these two dinosaurs were actually the same thing. Just one was grandpa. I've heard that with the Tyrannosaurus, Tyrannosaurus rex, um, that they originally thought that there were two different species, but it's actually like a younger T-Rex. Right. Yeah, that's been a big thing lately. The adolescent T-Rex apparently ate completely different from dad. So the adolescents were very fast and could dominate their environments, but chasing a completely different kind of food. And that came up in conversation because there were no medium-sized theropods that filled that niche. And so it looks like it might have been filled with T-Rex, and as T-Rexes grew up, they just dominated more and more and more. And of course, a 40-foot-long T-Rex can eat whatever the heck he wants. But of course, they can't run fast. The thinking now is they can't run at all. That T-Rexes could walk like dinosaur, like not dinosaurs, but elephants. If you watch them, they have to have feet on the ground constantly because of their weight. And so if a T-Rex was like that, it could probably walk as fast as it could. But then if it was a scavenger, it doesn't matter. Probably it could do ambush hunting, but we're not sure. But it was the youngsters that were doing all the running and chasing. Cool, fascinating, thank you. Yeah. I see Elliot? It. Yes. Uh is there any uh, reason that those dinosaurs got so large? Anything special that made them so big and how long did they live? Yeah, great questions. The size thing has been studied ad infinitum and then a lot of these arguments are still going on. But there are several advantages to being big. Number one, if you're big, you can hold more food in your gut and let bacteria work on it for weeks as it roils around in there. Another reason to get big is probably the most obvious. If you are a giant, if you're 120 feet long, nobody can kill you. There's not even a T-Rex could kill these big dinosaurs. So you're safe or at least relatively safe. And another really good reason for getting big is heat. While you and I have to put on jackets, you know, when winter comes because we get cold, when you get the size of some of these large dinosaurs, you're not trying to stay warm. You're trying to dump heat because there's something called a surface to volume ratio. And when you're really big, the comparison between your skin size and the volume of your body changes so much that you keep your heat in. Now, remember those specialized lungs on birds? I had a diagram that showed how birds breathe and it takes two breaths to get it in and out. Those air sacs were much more extensive than the pictures I showed. For example, on the sauropods, there's a 
that Momentosaurus that had this one. Remember this guy? Its, its neck looks like a snake. But one of the reasons they could do that is the bones in its neck were hollow and those air sacs extended all the way into their neck. In other words, making it lightweight. It was like styrofoam, some of their bones. Birds today have air sacs that go into their arm bones and other parts of their skeleton. It makes them lighter. And when they breathe out, it takes their body heat and blows it away. So an animal that has trouble controlling its heat needs a trick like that. So humans probably can't get that big because we would get too hot if we had enormous bodies. But dinosaurs had that trick. And so heat and predation and just general ad other advantages all kind of work together on that. There's, so there's a lot of conversation about big bodies. Sure. I have another question. Um, uh -huh. So another um, like unique feature of birds is that they do have those hollow bones. Yeah. Can we see the evolution of that in dinosaurs? Yes. Cool. It was because the idea is that they had these air sacs early on. It was one of their survival tricks when the competition was pretty serious. The air sacs were not only a survival trick, but it allowed them to take on the many body shapes that the different groups of dinosaurs have taken on. And even though the outside of their bones is very thin, the, uh, the biomechanics here, there are lots of little cross hatches, little bones on the inside of those hollow bones that link it up and make it strong. It's like our hip bones are not very solid. If you look at them with a microscope, it's full of little, little hollow places. It's very strong, however, because of that cross bracing. And so as early as that developed, it turned out it had a lot of advantages, like even to the extent of how it breathes and saving weight. So the group of dinosaurs that got small were also very lightweight and they had feathers and all of these evolutionary trends kind of came together and produced this miracle uh, that we call birds. Thanks. There's some good books out there, by the way. Here's one, Flying Dinosaurs, a lot of strange dinosaur fossils and how they evolved. If you wanted a good summary of it, this is a fairly recent one by Stephen Brissat, uh, who, who is teaching in uh, Scotland at a university. This is a nice summary of the story up to date of the evolution of dinosaurs. The rise and fall of the dinosaurs, the untold story of a lost world. And there are many others. I mean, bookstores are full of really good books and pictures of dinosaurs. Cool, thank you. Hey, I'll I can pick some of those books up. <laughs> yeah, good. I can talk dinosaurs as long as you want to. So somebody's going to have to push me off my chair. <laughs> we really appreciate your time, Elia, and just so interesting. Any other questions, anyone? Any, any last questions? Well, I'd love to just give you a big thank you and a big round of applause. I saw some people clapping earlier happening. So I just so appreciate it. Um, thank you so much. And, we hope everyone will join us on November 6th for some more dinosaurs. Um, we'll have hopefully some people of all ages there to participate. So we'd love to have all of you and anyone you would like to invite to join us. And if you know any eight to 12 year olds that would like to learn about all sorts of earth science topics, um, please have them sign up to join us um, later in November. And thank you all for being here this evening um, here on your Friday night to talk dinosaurs with us.